so good. He's watched over me. He's brought me thus far, and he's not going to leave me where I am. How many guys love the goodness of God? Come on, let's thank God one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and grab a seat, and on your way to your seat, just find one and a half person and just say, hey, good morning, welcome home. One and a half people. Come on, you got to find that half person, one and a half. Welcome to the house. Hey, if this is your first time here with us, uh, TFH Oakland. Oh, come on now. No, okay, I'm joking. Uh, if this is your first time, we do want to say thank you for joining us and, and making God a priority on this beautiful Sunday morning. Isn't the weather great in California? Come on. Sometimes we're like beating up on California. Man, we got the best weather. Looks great outside. You look good too. Dang, girl, you look good. You look good too. I'm talking to my wife right there. Uh, but this is your first time here. Uh, we do want to see you follow Jesus and also find community. Uh, and on the seat right where you were landed, uh, you would find this beautiful card right here. If this is your first time, feel free to fill that out. And immediately after service, you go to that connect tent and they have a free gift for you. They got a couple of free gifts. You can get a Bible, journal, mug. But really what we want to do is we want to walk with you. Uh, we do believe that family is the most important thing about our church. We want people to find community and live life together as they're following Jesus. And so for your next step, make sure you check this card out. We have something exciting that's really happening. Uh, that's really happening. We're something that's really exciting that's happening. Uh, in two weeks, we are doing baptisms. So if you would like to get baptized, come on, let's make some noise for that. We're really juiced about that. Um, if you would like to get baptized, again, you can fill out that card and check, hey, I want to get baptized. And uh, we would love to celebrate the story of Jesus coming into your life and hear how God's done that. Where's Zoe at? Where's Zoe? Zoe in the back. Beautiful Zoe. Uh, you can also connect with her. I just put her on the glass. Zoe's amazing. Clap it up for Zoe. She's just fantastic. Human being. So proud of you. Faithful. Uh, but you can check with Zoe. She'll make sure you get signed up. And if you show up and want to get baptized, we got shorts. We got a shirt. We, we'll take care of you, boo. We got you. Uh, so we definitely want to see that. So make sure you sign up for that. Uh, if this is your home church, we're going to prepare to give. We do believe in blessing God and tithing the 10% to honor him. I've seen God so faithful in my life. Every time there's been a need, there's been moments where I've been in deficit, moments where I needed a job and had been in the body of Christ. And God has always been faithful as I trusted him with my finances. And so there's a number of ways that you can give. You can give in the box as you leave the service, or you can give online, or you can do it on the app, the TFH Oakland app. So make sure that you do that. And without further ado, we're going to jump into the word and uh, we're going to believe that God's going to speak to us. We're in a fresh series called The Search. Everybody say The Search. Uh, everybody's been searching for some stuff. People have been searching for new jobs. Anybody looking for a new job? Anybody want a new job? Don't be bashful. Somebody like, yeah, I want a new job. Father, we pray for new jobs, new positions, better positions in Jesus' name. Here's a crazy thing. I think today we've seen five people find brand new jobs, literally, since people have come to TFH Oakland. So you can find a husband and find a job. Shoo, you get hooked up. We got a whole smorgasbord of gifts for you. Um, but people are searching. And so I do pray that you find a great job, that God will put you in the right position, the right place. And that we've seen miraculously people have gone without jobs for a year and literally supernaturally got a job and like good jobs, not like, you know, some regular job. I mean, like, like really like, wow, that's crazy. That is God. Cause you don't deserve that job. Like that kind of job. Uh, we all want those things. God does things that we don't deserve. So we're in a, a series called the search. And, uh, really this is a, a shameless plug for you to really understand how God's created you. Uh, that there's searching inside of your heart. There's things that you're looking for that I don't think you're just looking for a new occupation. I don't think you're just looking for a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend. I don't think you're just looking for a new location or a new house. I think there's actually a deeper search that is going underneath the surface. And I think that if we can connect to that deep, real, authentic search, there's an intersection, an intersection between our hearts and God's purpose. That there is something that God has placed inside of us to do in the earth that will help your life, that will help others. There is this, this sweet spot that I believe that God has called us to be. And I believe the church should be the best place for you to find and discover how God has wired you. There's been so much revelation that has been worldly revelation and understanding with personality and, and psychoanalysis and all of this and understanding. Are you Myers-Briggs and are you a Puton? What? A two-point eight wing, whatever, what's the whole thing, you know, eight wing, seven? I'm like, just give me a whole bucket. I'll just, that's my personality. You know, I get it, a wing. Moving on. Nobody got that. It's all right. I'm trying, you guys. I'm trying. I'm trying. 
But with all beyond the personalities, I believe that there's a purpose that God wants us to discover. And I really, really want us to increase in our understanding, not only of God, but how God has wired us to make a difference. And I believe that God has called you, yes, you, with your introvertness or your shyness or your reluctance or your hesitant to be around people that God has called you to make an impact in someone else's life. And I don't think it's all that crazy. I believe that people are doing so much that God wants them to do right now, they just don't understand how God has called them to work in that area. I don't think the purpose of God is so far out. Like people are like, what is the mystery of life? And I believe today we can actually answer, what is, why are we on this planet? Now that may be a feat because you're like, bro, you don't got the education to do that. But I do believe that by God's grace and his wisdom, he's going to show us through his word. So if you guys got your Bibles, we're going to open up to Matthew chapter 13. Uh, and if you don't have your Bibles, it's going to be all good. It's going to be on the screen. Uh, we're going to do kind of a little bit of teaching and preaching. We're going to look at Matthew 13. And in the process of this, I'm going to just read one verse, give you the context of why this verse is important to us. And then we're going to unpack it and move on from there. Let me get my note. Boom. There we go. Matthew 13. It says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had bought, all he had and bought that field. This is one of the parables that Jesus shows us, and he begins to say, here's the vastness of God. When he says the kingdom of God, he's talking about God's purpose for humanity. The kingdom of God is like a man who finds this hidden treasure in a field. He doesn't tell anyone. He doesn't want anyone to know, no other investors. He goes back home. He sells everything that he has to possess that land in order to get this treasure. Now, this parable is actually sandwiched through other parables in Matthew chapter 13. Contextually, what's going on is Jesus begins to address about two or three things in these parables. And he first starts off by, with these parables by talking about seed. Now, seed is a metaphor for God's word. That means how God views us, how God values us. We can even say it's a metaphor for the scriptures. It's a metaphor for how God sees humanity. And Jesus begins to say there are two things that will oppose people understanding their purpose on the earth. He says the first one is this. It's the condition of their heart, that God can speak something to you, but if your heart is not ready to receive it, you will turn it away. You'll see it dry up. It will not produce anything. And the second thing that he says is not just the condition of someone one's heart, but it's circumstances. He says that as people are growing in their understanding with God, there is a real enemy that wants to attach itself to the purposes of God and pervert God's plan. That means to take it off course, to deviate from God's intended location and landing. He says that, that there is this enemy that actually wants to sabotage the purposes of God in your life. Now, when we talk about an enemy, we refer to him as, as Satan. It's God's enemy. It's God. It's the antithesis of all that is God. Now, if you see a person with spandex and a pitchfork and a red suit, that is not Satan. I don't know what parade they got free from, but that is not the Satan that we're talking about. The Satan is literally, it manifests or he manifests himself in different circumstances and situations that are counterfeit to what God's plan in our lives. Sometimes Satan can actually manifest into a relationship that you can find someone that on the surface, they all that you've been searching for and you realize that there is something else that is broken, messed up. And because of your own insecurities and your own messed upness, you actually begin to circumstantially partner in the kingdom of darkness. And we're like, bro, bro, what happened? But because of what's going on underneath the surface. The Bible says that, that the enemy comes as an angel of light that he actually offers things that seems pleasing on the surface, but once you dig deeper, you realize there's a bunch of maggots and there's something rotten beneath that. So how do we live in this place? How do we live in this place of searching for the purposes of God and actually finding something that is authentic, genuine, and real and simultaneously being happy? Because I think a lot of Christians have done us a disservice that to follow God just means that you're gonna be angry, frustrated, broke, unhappy, and all your friends are gonna be ugly. <laughs> I'm like, and that is not the God that I serve. That is not the kingdom of God. I believe that when we serve God and we find a place of honoring him, not only does God expand our relationships, but God begins to heal us from the inside out. And that God begins to incrementally reveal how we are to use and leverage our purpose, our, 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 even our ideas, our creativity to see God open up and express aspects of himself to humanity. You're a school teacher. You can express 
the love of God. You're a mom or a dad. You get the opportunity to express the creative power and nature of God, the long suffering, the patience of changing diapers and hearing cries at three o'clock in the morning. You get to express the nature of God. You're a student in high school. You get to express the nature of God by doing things you don't want to do, by submitting to God, by honoring your parents. If you are a creative director for a firm, you get to express the creative nature of God. Then when God said, let there be light, he illuminated the darkness. You get to share and leverage your gifts and all those components. You're an Uber driver. You just became a counselor and didn't even know it. Because people are going to share their souls as you Uber in them. You see, there's an intersection that God wants to reveal who and why we are in this moment, in this city, at this time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray. Teach us how to search beneath the surface. Teach us how to look and see our circumstances, even in the midst of sickness and disease, even in the midst of chaos. There is something that you're wanting to reveal to us. We ask that you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the funny thing is, is my wife uh, loves these stories. Uh, is there any podcasters, like you love listening to podcasts? Is there any podcasters? Come on, I like podcast people. Put it on in the gym, you'd be like, yeah, I'm getting smart. Oh, y'all stupid. No, I'm just joking. But my wife loves podcasts, and uh, we just uh, got back from vacation, and she likes this podcast called Criminal. Have you guys ever heard of it? It is amazing. I love a good story. It, I can see some of you are like, yeah, bruh. That stuff is weird. <laughs> uh, I would encourage you. It, it, it's definitely worth a listen. Some of the stories are just so far out there. And on the way back, we were on the I-5, and my wife turned on one of these episodes called Criminal. It was called The Masquerade. And uh, the criminal podcast literally is just like this in, uh, reporter who's investigating some stories that are 100 years old, five years old. Uh, there was recently a story even about Oakland in there and these, all kinds of crazy stuff. But this story really struck me because it, it, it showcased this author slash writer who was a little bit weird. His name was Kit Williams, not Cat Williams, Kit Williams, because I know how y'all think you're like, Cat Williams is writing this? You know, Kit Williams. Uh, he's a European guy, and Kit Williams, he decides in 1979 to write this children's book called The Masquerade. And as he's writing, he gets this idea that he is going to parallel the story to real locations and that if you will look beneath the surface of the book, you can actually identify landmarks in which he has hidden treasure. This is some Willy Wonka, Assassin's Creed kind of ready player one stuff. I mean, like this is like some real crazy stuff going on. And so he literally writes this book, 1979, he releases it, and he says a 10-year-old can find the treasures. And he literally begins to bury these treasures years in advance, and his hope and desire is that someone will read the books, begin to decipher the language and the codes in the books, and then begin to go to those landmarks. He buried it somewhere deep in London, but he wanted to make it available for the whole world to be able to participate in. So you had to call him, and he himself would pick up the phone, and if you got the exact location right, he would confirm over the phone and then fly you to London to go bury, unbury the treasure yourself. This is some freaky Willy Wonka stuff, bro. Like, this is like, what is going on? And this is a true story. Like, Kit Williams is still alive today. This is, y'all not as juiced as I was, so <laughs> this message may not go so well because this is the crux of the message right here, this whole story. But long story short, he got 200 letters every single day for three years straight. And Kit begins to become so disheartened because no one is able to figure out the location. And what he did is he had this rabbit that was pure gold. And the story was about this relationship between the sun and the moon. And the moon hires the rabbit to go deliver it to the sun. And then the rabbit loses it. And so it was this whole weird story. But it was this gold rabbit that he had buried in this secret location. And people started doing something very unique that I thought was interesting. One, people started to just guess and superimpose their guesses onto the story. So they started coming to their own conclusions, like maybe this is this, and then they would superimpose it, and that was it. And as the time went on, people started to believe that the story was all made up. They actually started believing that Kit Williams never existed, that this book was all a charade. It was actually a ghostwriter that wrote this book. And all the while, Kit Williams is at home, literally losing his mind, because he wanted people to enjoy this search. Now, the reason why I share that story with you is because I almost feel like God is kind of like that. Like, I feel like 
not in this weird manipulative thing, but I think God is really interested in his kids in such a way that God would create a search and he would put indicators in our life that would lead to this moment where we begin to discover who he is. The Bible actually alludes that the only way for you to know God is not because you woke up one day and was like, you know what, <laughs> I'm going to stop twerking and I'm going to go church. <laughs> like, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't work like that. Like the Bible says that God first reveals himself to us. There are these breadcrumbs that we begin to discover and we have these conversations and we had that friend in high school that was a Christian that we thought was weird, but now we're in a place where we actually feel like God may be speaking to us, but we've never heard the voice of God, but we feel this longing, this drawing, this search to want to know God and we find ourselves in a building and we're like, this is weird. Is this the Illuminati? What is going on? No, this is Jesus. And Jesus begins to express and these people. And then we find like something is growing inside of me. And I want to know more about this. And I'm on this road of discovery. And all the while, God has been watching like a good coach, marking and showcasing and depositing and guiding us for us to discover who he is. And he doesn't just stop there. He wants you to find where the X on the map really is. Few people did end up discovering their treasure, but we'll talk about that because it gets a little weird and twisted. But the part that I want to bring back to our attention is this, is that Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is much like this. He said the kingdom of heaven is like a man who literally finds this treasure that no one knows about. He sells all of his possessions in order to buy the land in order to get that treasure. Now, Jesus will explain a little bit more, but this man is Jesus towards us. But before we get to there, let's kind of unpack some of the things that were going on with this. So this is what happened. And when Jesus is in Matthew 13, he begins to tell us what people, what happens to people when they search just on the surface. And he goes on and he says this in 13.3. He says, Jesus told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. He said, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. And Jesus goes on and he begins to talk about how a farmer plants some seeds. And the, the one seed actually took root and it began to germinate and it began to produce fruit. One seed, it fell on hardened soil and it produced nothing. And Jesus begins to parallel and he says, these parables are used to teach you to understand. So that you can understand how God works. And he says this that's just really remarkable, which I think is so good for us. But Jesus says the reason why people don't discover their purpose in life when it comes to connecting with God and who they were created to do or what, who they were created to become and who they are is the reason is that the, the soil actually corrupts the seed. He said their hearts are not ready to receive anything from God. The seed landed on hard soil. That is the condition of the heart. Here's the crazy thing is this, is that as a pastor, this is probably one of the most frustrating things for me. Because I could preach a message, I could be funny, I could be make you cry, I could do all of these things, I can't make you cry, but I can like do everything that I can in my part to facilitate for someone to know God. But if their hearts are not right, it's like casting seed on dry soil. So I realized there's a responsibility that I have as your pastor to be able to love God and go into the word and express this. But there is a responsibility that you have to monitor the condition of your heart. Because you can be in the building, but you can have a hardened heart and expect to receive something from God. But because of pain and agony or shame and regret and the refusal to acknowledge these things, your heart becomes hardened. And it's like seed just bouncing on concrete. The Bible says that, hey, if you want to be a searcher that goes beyond the surface, you have to realize that something is equally as important is the condition of your soul, how you are accepting God's will and desire for your life. And if you refuse to do it, there are some components that will actually sabotage God's purpose in your life because God can tell you, God can speak to you. But if your heart is hardened, if you're distracted by all of the things that consume your attention, the word of God will never dig deep into your heart and take root. The Bible says that there will actually become birds that will see the seed. And this is a metaphor. I don't know why the Bible always depicts birds as something evil, but we have a bunch of crows in front of our house. And it's a little scary. You know crows are the only bird that can actually recognize and remember a person if they've done something good or bad. That's weird. Edgar Allan Poe. Come on now. That's weird. The Bible always depicts something evil as birds. And I get freaked out by crows because crows are like not a small bird. Like I feel like a crow would be like, hey, bruh. <laughs> coo -coo -coo. Like, I mean, like I feel like crows are little beastly. I don't know why I shared that. But long story short, the Bible always depicts crows as someone that's evil or birds as evil. And what he says is, is this, is that if we get into a place where we are near the word of God, but we are not willing to accept God's call in our lives, 
that there is an enemy that will come and snatch out that word. You see, there's actually a duration between when God tells you to do something and your act of obedience that will actually cause you to stop where you are or move forward in faith. That's why the Bible says that if you need wisdom and you ask God for it, but you doubt, don't expect to receive anything from God. Why? Because your heart is not ready to receive. That's why when we go into the word or even in moments of worship, there's something that I always do. I say, God, make my heart ready. God, soften my heart to hear you, to be able to be sensitive to your voice. And I'm telling you, there are moments that you can become so hard-hearted, so stiffed, so frustrated, so exhausted that God's presence and his nearness can be so available, but you're not ready to receive. And to take note of that is a great moment to say, God, forgive me for my hard heart. Jesus goes on and he begins to talk a little bit more about the conditions of the seed and also our hearts. And Jesus shares another story and he says, here's another story. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in the field, but at night the workers slept and his enemy came and planted seeds among the wheat. They slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, sir, the field where you planted the good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer said. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. And the farmer says, no. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. He says this, that there are going to be moments where literally God's people will continue to grow. And the reason why God doesn't just destroy all the people that don't believe him. Have you ever prayed that prayer? God set them all on fire. (laughs) Don't like them. But God reveals through this parable the reason why he allows Christians or believers or followers of Christ who know God to live adjacent with non-believers is because even in God's benevolence, he is extending grace. And to remove one, he would have to remove the other. So Jesus allows, he's saying that God loves people, humanity in such a way that he would rather for Christians to live alongside the weed in order, not, 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 not dispensaries or anything like that, okay? Like, I like this church, okay? Blunts it more, I like that, I like it. To live alongside those that are broken. But here's the crazy thing is he says that there will come a moment in time where we will have to stand before God and give an account for what we've done. That God is the ultimate gardener. And what we have to be careful of is this, is that while God's grace is fully operational and accessible, that we don't allow our hearts to become so hardened or that we serve God half-heartedly and that we don't fail to remember that we are in a place, in a position to be light to darkness and that you have a role as long as you have breath in your lungs. And there may be family members, there may be coworkers, there may be people that you live alongside with and you don't understand why they are so close to you, but could Could it be that God has a purpose in the middle of that? And they're a part of that journey. But Jesus goes on and he begins to express this, which this is the crux of the message. And Jesus is, he's talking about viewing eternity. He's talking about the church and he's saying that this is what's going to happen. And he says that if we live our lives in light of eternity, it should change us. And the way that God sees humanity is like this. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. And in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Here's the thing that you have to understand to live a life that searches beyond the surface. First thing that you have to understand is how God views you. Here's the thing. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying God and his God is God is the man in this story. And God sees this treasure in the midst of this land, this field, and he doesn't want anyone else to know about it. So what he decides is this, that he will sell everything and he will purchase this land in order to get this treasure. This is a metaphor. This is, this is a, a, a connected piece to, for us to understand Jesus' thoughtful sacrifice that he had for us. Because for you, you are the treasure to God. Now, I know we've been in Christian, you know, been in church for a while. I'm like, I am God's treasure. Thank you, Sky Daddy. I love you. But let us not forget that Jesus says that you're the treasure. That he would sacrifice, sell all things in order to obtain you. And in the process of doing that, what he's saying is this. It's for God's concern, humanity is top priority. And God will do whatever it takes in order to get you. 
God is loving and compassionate in such a way that he will sell everything, sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice in order for you to experience his devotion, his commitment. And guess what? He's willing to buy the whole field as long as he can get you. You see, this lays a foundation because if God values you in this way, how should you value and treat your brother and sister and the people you live with? He's trying to shape our understanding because one, if we felt fully, fully committed to this idea that God not only cares for me, he has concern for me, that I am God's treasure, that if I am in the middle of God's plan and purposes, no matter what happens in my life, I know that I belong to God. So when I'm walking through chaos and confusion, it's not God's punishment in my life. It's actually that God is my treasure and that sometimes God will allow me to walk through things, but that doesn't diminish his devotion for me. I'm God's treasure. God values me. Now, when we talk about finding a treasure, the reason why a person would hide this, this is actually a war-torn country. In Syria to this day, people are leaving and abandoning their homes on a daily basis. They will abandon their treasure in hopes that one day they will be able to return. And so here's the thing, that this workman, this man, he's probably working for someone else. And by Jewish law at that time, that if you were working for someone and you found a hidden treasure, it was actually the owner's treasure, the person, your, your supervisor's treasure. And so the man keeps it in secret. He doesn't want anyone to know when he purchases this. Now, if we were to modernize this, I would say this is like Shark Tank. You know what I'm talking about? Is there any Shark Tank fans? Now, I wanted to modernize this, so you know, so I always have to bring like a little illustration. So I wanted to kind of do this. Again, my illustrations could be fantastic or it can totally suck. So I wanted to do this thing where we're going to do a shark tank. So we're just going to switch roles. So let's just kind of pretend you're the, you're the sharkers. And I guess I'm the tank person. What is it? I don't watch the TV show. I just was like, hey, let's do it. So shark tank. If you're not familiar with the show of shark tank, what it is, it's a bunch of investors. They have all of this, you know, this repertoire, they got all of this money, FUBU, boo-boo, they got all of this stuff, they fly planes, they own Dallas, they got all of these things. And so a person will show up on the show and they will say, hey, this is a gadget, this is a gizmo, a plenty, and I have all of these things and I want you to invest and partner with me. Now, I think it's funny, like, what if we were to do that and God was like one of the investors? And I'm like, hello, how you doing? It's so good to be on Shark Tank. How you doing? My name is Jules. Today, I want to introduce you a new application called My Life the life no one wants. And with your partnership, I can take this worldwide. My life comes filled with insecurities, trauma from my childhood, plans that completely failed, relationships that obliterated right before my eyes. And I too, can, with your partnership and guidance, can see my life go into every home. What do you say? No. <laughs> this is why I'm single. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But the reality of this is this. If we were to look at our lives in that kind of terminology, who would invest in us? And so the search that we have is for someone to meet that need in that void, to make me feel like I'm okay. The shame and the regret and the pain that we don't share, that we don't talk about, that remains beneath the surface is actually enlarging. It's, it's actually strengthening that search. And if we're not careful, we will allow other people to invest in us that don't have God's priorities in their lives. We will partner with other people thinking that this partnership is actually going to meet a void, but in reality, that if Jesus is not your primary investor, if Jesus has not come from the sidelines and says, yes, guess what? I see all of the shame. I see all of the mistakes. I see all of the things that you walk through, but guess what? I still want to invest in that. I still want that life. I still want to be a part of that. I still want to be involved. Jesus is the only one that looks beyond all of those excuses and those pains. And he says, guess what? I will still buy that application. You know, one of the greatest mistakes that Shark Tank season five made was this. There was a little device called the ring and it showed up and all of the Shark Tankers were like, no, nah, we don't want nothing to do with that. Do you know the ring was not only invested in by one of the biggest investors and partnered and then Amazon bought it and ring to this day is probably on every doorstep, business, commercial or residential property. And here's the thing. There are moments that we have opportunity to invest and we can miss those moments. But God never misses those moments with us. 
You have to understand that your whole faith is literally a down payment of God saying this, I will show you grace, I will forgive you because I have a purpose for your life and I see something that no one else sees. And if you could see what I see, I think we can take this thing worldwide. I think we can change some things. If you saw the power and the potential that God placed inside of you, this is more than self-help. This is called the gospel. Because I don't know about you, but I've been broken. I've had things happen to me that I didn't want happen to me. And it could have fixated me and twisted me and manipulated me and had me filled with insecurity and manipulation. But no, 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 no. Somebody saw a treasure in me that I didn't see. And someone began to say, I see something in you. And it's more than your excuses. It's more than your pain. It's more the background of your family. I see the treasure that God has placed inside of you. And Jesus says, man, I will purchase all that pertains to you just so that I can have you. That's the gospel. That God can redeem even the most broken things in our life. The shame, you don't have to live with that. Most religions till this, to this day speak of the way that you can earn off your shame is by benevolence. And maybe one day you'll come back as a butterfly if you do great things. If you keep doing these things, then just maybe you will get karma. Just if you do these things, then maybe Allah will forgive you. If you do these things, but Jesus says, no, 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 I will invest first. You ain't got nothing to give me. <laughs> Trust me, I don't want what you got. There's something beneath the surface that I want to pull out of you. Now, to take this same parable and to apply it for our standards, all scripture is inspired by God, for God, for us. What's the treasure for us? If we were to take this same, this parable, this analogy, what's the treasure for our lives? The treasure for us is discovering our purpose connected to the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, if we could kind of break this down and, and use it a little bit further, I believe that God wants our search to become so clear. And I want to break this down in just this verse of scripture. It says this, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. And in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. The thing that I love about this is what's the treasure to God is us. And once God has us, God doesn't just leave us where we are. God continues to unpack our purpose. The first question I have for you this morning is where's your treasure? This is this. This is where's your purpose and your significance in context to the plans of God? You see, most of us, we feel like our career, maybe our relationship, maybe our occupation, our family, that is who we are. That, those are aspects and components that have made you, but there is something singularity that God has created in you. I've heard someone say it this way, that when God had a purpose, he put it inside of a person. Your personality, the way that God made you, you are wired to do something. And there are probably things that you do already, but where's your treasure? You see, this is where an indicator of God's purpose in your life, you can use this as kind of a defining purpose, a point of is this. Where or who do I see value that no one else does? Now, I'll say that again. If you wanted to discover, like, what's my purpose? I got a job, but what's, what's beyond that? What's beyond what I'm doing currently? What is that divine part? Where do you see value that no one else sees value? Who do you see value that no one else sees value? Because when this man purchased this field, he saw something valuable that no one else could see. Let me break this down for you. For me, it's my city. I see value in my city. I was actually sitting with an old uh, high school student of mine. We were having lunch and he was like, man, one time I remember I was talking about Oakland and literally six years ago, you literally went upside my head. He was like, man, the way that you talked about Oakland, you were like, man, I believe that God has called, he's got a move of God for Oakland. I believe all of the homelessness, I believe that's a work and a role of the church to be able to make a difference in that. He's like, the way that you were talking about Oakland six years ago is the same thing that you're talking about now. And other people, there's been conversations where I'll be like, yeah, I'm a pastor in Oakland. They're like, Oakland? Uh, I'm like, shut up. You ain't never been to the town. And people don't see the value that I see. 
But when I drive down the street, I can see beyond the homelessness. I can see beyond the poverty. I can see beyond the addiction. And there's something that's inside of me that says, I see value where no one else sees value. I see that there is a promise and a hope. And I believe that the role of the church is not to just complain about it, but just to be about it. To not just talk about it, but to see service in a city that has been marginalized. And we're not waiting for no government to make a difference. It's actually called God's people to make a difference. It's you. And if your life is filled with complaint, but guess what? That's maybe for me. And I'm believing that God has called us together to see the city the way that God sees the city. So when we begin to expand laundry loves and when we begin to purchase property and we begin to invest in community centers that is actually making a difference and creating church in the middle of the week, we're going to need people like you that says, you know what? I see beyond the surface because there's a great search that's happening and I get to be a part of it of seeing lost and broken people come to find Jesus Christ. See, I see the church differently. I don't see it as a building. I don't see it as an occupation. I don't see it as a platform for influence and double taps. I see it as an entity of hope in the earth. And I believe that the church has done some crazy things, some toxic things. We've rejected things and we've marginalized people. But I believe there is still transformation that is in the power of God. And even in this scripture, if you want to be super heady, he actually talks about this mustard seed plant and expanding into a tree, which is an abnormal. An abnormal, an abnormal, an abnormity for a plant of that size. So the church has sometimes have experienced abnormal growth and actually would occupy the enemy, which is crazy. We can go real deep in that, but we're not. Sunday morning, we'll save that for our Wednesday night Bible study. But I believe that God is doing something fresh in the church. And it's going to require a new depth of authenticity. And it's going to require people to look beyond the surface and to inquire about this real savior named Jesus. But the crazy thing is is this, where do you see value that no one else does? That is an indicator of your purpose. That is an indicator beyond your job. There are people in this room right now, you're like, man, single moms. My heart goes out for that. Hey man, my, my heart goes out for this. Don't push that down. There is something deeply connected to that. And I believe that God has called us to be a house to help facilitate opportunity and create opportunity for people to discover that treasure that is inside of them. Philippians chapter 3, it says this, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, but I've already, I have not already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus has first possessed me. The second thing is this, what, comes, what causes you to come alive? Our passions can have redemptive potential. Passions are indicators, not navigators. But when God puts something inside of us, it creates a passion. It invigorates us. It gives us something inside of us that we're like, man, I have to be a part of it. And here's the crazy thing. Much like this field, this is where most Christians stop. They discover what their their purpose is. They get passionate about it. But they stop when it comes to the all-in commitment. It says this man, he sees this field, he sees the treasure, he goes after it, he's filled with passion. And the Bible says that he goes back, sells all that he possessed, and he fully commits to be able to say, I want all of it. And most Christians, what we do is this, we want a half-hearted commitment to Christ, but we want all the purpose and blessing and grace and glory that he has to offer. At some point, if you want to discover what God wants for you, it requires a commitment to say, God, I'm destroying all other distractions. I am going all in. God, I'm leveraging aspects of my life to see your purposes in the earth. And I know there's some of you like, man, Pastor Jules, I'm all in. Great, good for you. But that is probably a tithe of the rest of the house to where God says there are all of us in this place. What if? You, me, her, them, us are living with this singular focus and passion to say, God, I know what the treasure is for me. I know what you've called me to do. I'm passionate about it. And God, I'm committed to see it happen, even if it costs me something. See, what I want to ask you today is this. For you to be a part of this house, it's going to cost you something. And I'm not just talking about monetary. I'm talking about it's going to cost some of you. Because there are people that God has placed in your life that only you can reach. There are people that only you will connect with. And there are things that God has actually caused you to create because no one else sees those people. 
And if you're waiting for the church to discover your idea, you're going to wait too long. And you're making an excuse for what God has put inside of you. Now, I want to partner with you. I believe if there's things that God has placed in your heart, how can we partner with you? But that's your field. I believe that God's called us to have a field. You see, the, the, the crux of this story where we were talking about the masquerade, these two physicists, they actually found a location. And because of the spring equinox and the shadow of the cross that was at this particular lo the location, they couldn't figure out exactly where it is. And they started digging, but somehow they stopped. These two physicists, they started digging and they were in the perfect place and they stopped. Here's the thing that I never wanted to be about us. Don't get so close to your purpose that you stop digging. Don't get so close to the thing that God is placing you. And if I can be so blunt and to say this, there are people in this room right now, there are things that God has called you to do and to release in this house, and we need you to continue to dig. And that could be as practical as taking that next step of saying, God, I'm going to do discover. God, I'm going to open up a small group. But I believe that where we're going as a church, even as we're preaching this series, that I believe there are two things that God has called us to do to dig deeper. In and in a deeper search is this. One, that we need to be so insatiably hungry to see lost and broken people find and discover Jesus. And number two, to love our city like we've never loved it before. And I believe there's an intersection where God is going to begin to open your heart to say, you know what, I need to be in a place where I'm ready to serve and continue to help someone else find life. I want to be at a place where I'm able to open up my home or sit down and have coffee and be able to connect with someone because there are people that I see that no one else sees. And that's where God has called me to find treasure. I'm going to pray with us as we begin to close. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are such a God of grace. I pray that, Lord, we would never stop digging. God, I pray for the believer, Lord, that has been on the team for a, a long time and they've come to a place where they're like, you know what, God, I've done that, I've done this. God, I pray that you would bring a resurgence of passion. God, I pray the small groups that need to be created, Lord, the leaders that are afraid and they're like, I'm, I'm intimidated. No, God, begin to bring to the surface that they see someone that no one else sees. I ask, Lord, that as we begin to move into this chapter in this season of being a church that not only loves you, but loves those that are far away from you. Teach us how to find that intersection. This morning, if you're far away from God and you would say, you know what, Pastor Jules, I didn't know that I'm that treasure, but I'm far away from God. I've been living my life and I, I haven't really been focused on eternity at all. I haven't been focused really on anything outside of myself and realizing that God views me in this way, I, I want to be in relationship with if you're far away from God and you need to get right with him, we're not going to do anything weird or crazy, but every eye closed, every head bowed, what we're going to do is something very simple. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and all together, collectively, we're going to say a prayer. But if you say, hey, Pastor Jules, I am far away from God and I need to get right with him, would you be so bold and raise your hand and just say, hey, that's me. I'm far away from him. I'm not walking with him currently, but I need to get right. Jesus. 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 Let's pray this prayer. Just say, Father, I surrender my life to you. I give you everything. Have your way. Forgive me of my sins and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we would love to be able to connect with you and walk with you.